Um, what I'm going to do is give a slightly broader talk today, stemming from my own research on James and Mary, um, which looks at a broader period. And, and Beth will come back and talk about what we call the association negotiations, a very specific period in Mary and James's relationship next year. Um, so um, this actually all stems from a book that I've just finished called A Long Apprenticeship, The Early Life of James VI. Um, and that book focuses on James's really turbulent childhood and his rise to power. Um, now, James was the first Stuart king born into uh, a Protestant Scotland. Um, he was the first one subject to the Protestant church in terms of his coronation oath and in terms of the way that he was expected to rule. But he had an exceptionally turbulent early life. Um, he declared himself of adult age and technically of rule at the age of 11 and three quarters in March 1578. He was subject between 1578 and 1585 to no less than six palace revolutions, five of which were successful, and in one of which he was held prisoner for 10 months. Um, some of these, like the one in 1578, he was involved in, but a lot of them were done against his will. Um, and in that book, I look at James's early life, the formative influences on him and the people who really shape him. And that includes his, his surrogate uh, mother, uh, the Countess Mar. It includes Esme Stewart, his first favourite, who really sets the tone for James's early reign between 1579 and 1582 and causes major conflict at court, leading to the Ruthen Raid when, when James is held captive. Um, but the book also looks at James's relationship with Mary. And I was quite surprised when I started to delve into this relationship to find that there's actually not been a huge amount written on it or researched about it. There's a, a chapter in Antonia Fraser's book called Mother and Son, which briefly reviews their relationship. And there's also a, a fantastic wee pamphlet uh, by Caroline Bingham, who has written a number of biographies on James VI. And she calls their relationship relations. She says it's relations between James VI and Mary, not a relationship, which I think is actually right. I think that the relationship between Mary and James is one that does have some elements of familial connection, um, but we have to bear in mind that Mary is taken away from James. Um, she doesn't see him again after April 1567, when he's less than one year old. And in the year before that, they're not particularly close. Um, they spend that they never meet again in, in life after April 1567. Uh, James grows up without her and spends much of the 1570s without a connection to her. And while Mary has a, a strong maternal affection towards him, the relationship is one that is quite cold. It's quite pragmatic. They both want to use each other quite often for political purposes, and it can be quite tense. But at the same time, they both use the rhetoric of emotional and familial relationship to try and get things from one another. Now, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to trace through some of the key elements of that relationship. And I'm also going to bring in some of the items that we've got in the exhibition to just to, to focus thinking around that. I'm going to start by looking at the first year uh, between uh, 1566 and 1567. Then I'm going to look at all the propaganda that she used to remove Mary from the throne and to place James in her stead. Um, and that speaks very interestingly to ideas of gender and power, which are a core theme running through the exhibition. And then I'll finish up briefly by sketching out their later relationship into the 1570s and 1580s and look at a couple of key documents that I use in the book to do that. So, Jump straight, straight back in a little bit of context. In 1566, Mary is heavily pregnant with, with James VI, and it's during her pregnancy that, of course, the, the murder of David Rizzio takes place in Holyrood on the 9th of March. James's father, Henry Stuart Lord Darnley, is um, convinced to be involved in that murder, is heavily implicated. He is present. He's one of the first people into the room. Uh, to, to, to set up the murder, and his dagger is left in Rizzio's body. Um, Mary, at the time, is, is held with a, a pistol to her side, against her belly, by Andrew Kerr Fodden's side. And again, that moment is a really decisive one uh, for Mary. It, it makes her realise just how much of a danger uh, Darnley is, even though she escapes with him to Dunbar with the aid of uh, Bothwell. 
Um, and it, it really does terrorize her. And people worry that she, she's going to lose the baby and that she's um, going to miscarry. But she thankfully is okay, despite the great trauma of it and the horse ride down to Dunbar. On the 19th of June, 1566, she gives birth to James, um, his full name, Prince Charles James at this point. And she decides to give birth to him in Edinburgh Castle, the heavily militarized Edinburgh Castle, rather than Holyrood, because she's worried that Darnley or Murray or another group of male Protestant lords may try and seize James and use him as a, as a figurehead for their own political machinations. And indeed, that's exactly what happens. Mary is doing her part for the Stuart dynasty by having a child, and she knows that to further perpetuate and strengthen the dynasty, this is something she has to do. It's something she's been very focused on. She, she also tries to have a child with Francis I, and then she immediately sets about having a child with Darnley. And indeed, it's something that all royal dynasties are, are keen to do. But by giving birth to an heir, she is, in a, in, a, in a sense, setting herself up with a rival who her political rivals can use, particularly, as it turns out, because he's male, um, to undermine her and remove her. And this is something that Elizabeth chooses to avoid. But of course, Elizabeth doesn't have any uh, children. And so you can argue that in some ways she is less successful as a monarch because she doesn't look to perpetuate her dynasty. Now, um, we know that following the birth of James, there is a total breakdown of Darnley and Mary's marriage. There is the famous conference at Craig Miller where they discuss what to do with Darnley and Mary possibly looks through her fingers at the idea of having him murdered. Um, but it's certainly noted that, the, that, the, that something has to be done to Darnley. And at the same time, there is a rumour that Darnley will use um, the young James to seize control, to create a plot where he could place James on the throne and rule as the, the I suppose, the crown father, if you like. Now that doesn't stop Mary from using James as a, as a tool of international diplomacy and propaganda right from the moment that he's born. On, before he's born, she's using James to secure favour with Elizabeth. And she immediately asks Elizabeth to be godmother. And that's again how Elizabeth finds out about James's birth. She then, on the day that James is born, both uh, Darnley and Mary are sending letters to other heads of state asking for various favours, including um, troops and money from, from France and further support from England because they now have an heir. And then Mary, of course, throws a huge and lavish baptismal celebration for James on the 17th to 19th of December, 1566. It's been argued that that, that event was modeled after similar Renaissance fetes that Mary had seen in France during the reign of Henry II, and that it possibly echoed uh, a similar fete put on by Charles IX in the early phase of the Wars of Religion in the 1560s to look at reconciliation between rival factions in France. Um, there is a large programme of events, including the baptism itself. There's a dinner where um, nobles of both Protestant and Catholic sides in Scotland are serving all the assembled guests as a way of showing love, unity and reconciliation in Scotland. There is a hunt and there's poetic recitation and Mary is portrayed as both the re-founder of an Arthurian dynasty and as Astrea, the goddess of wisdom in this. And she's also puts on a, a giant, what we call feud artifice, uh, a, a, a big set piece in the garden of Stirling Castle. The message I think of this is debatable. It, it's hard to see if there is a big political message to it, but it's clear that Mary is saying through her son to Elizabeth, as is, is recorded in a poem by Patrick Adamson, that the importance of kingship is eternal, it will be in the power of the Stuart family and the British crown um, that awaits the, the Stuart dynasty under Mary and her children, and her grandchildren. Um, this is the a sketch done by Historic Environment Scotland of the feud artifice. This is the, the giant paper mache and wood fort that would have been outside Stirling Castle and um, which would have been uh, assaulted by mock armies, a huge big display just outside the castle. And the whole event was capped with fireworks. So a really great PR spectacle for Mary and a high point in what was a very, very difficult year. 
Now, as many of you will know, um, events rapidly fell apart after that. Uh, Darnley was murdered at Kirker Field in February 1567. There were many people who it could have been, but the finger was pointed at Mary's ally, the Earl Bothwell. Um, Bothwell himself manages to um, escape guilt at a show trial in April 1567, but then he goes and possibly coerces Mary. Um, she may have gone willingly, but it seems likely that he probably seized her and took her to Dunbar Castle, where he, he probably raped her and then forced her to marry him. Although, again, the, the, the events are, are highly debated. In doing so, the political community align against Mary and Bothwell. And then um, at the Battle of Carberry Hill, Mary is forced to surrender and Bothwell flees. And then following that, James himself is crowned as James VI. Um, it triggers a six year war where there are a series of regents beginning with James Stuart, the Earl of Murray, Mary's half brother, and then James's grandfather, Matthew Stuart, the Earl of Lennox, and James's guardian, John Erskine, the Earl of Mar. It's a very complex war, and I won't go into it in great detail, except to say there are two rival factions, the King's Party and the Queen's Party. Um, they're not split sort of pro-English, pro-Protestant, pro-James, and pro-French, pro-Catholic, pro-Mary. Their religious, dynastic, and political motivations are very porous, and indeed people move back and forth between the two parties. Um, but protection of the family patrimony is a key driver. But what's interesting is the King's Party are far weaker in terms of um, political control, in terms of the land they control and the number of men and manpower they have. And part of the, the reason they're able to retain control is by using James as a figurehead against Mary and by using her gender against her and using their relationship to, to cement um, opposition against Mary. And I'll show you some examples of how that propaganda is used to portray their relationship. Firstly, um, there are a series of proclamations put out both by Mary and the King's men, um, suggesting that James is being protected by each of them. And Mary releases a proclamation saying that in James's good success, her joy consists. And without him, um, Her Majesty could never think herself in good estate. And she, but yeah, she sees that people are busy in his infancy to get um, to, to build a faction around him and to try and take him from her. But she says, he is absolutely my priority in life and everything I do is to protect his future, future throne. The King's men respond initially when Mary's married to Bothwell by saying that they're purely interested in attacking Bothwell as a threat to Mary and James. They say he's ravished the Queen. They say that he's going to kill the young James. But increasingly, and certainly by the time of Carberry, their proclamations are saying that Mary and Bothwell are a threat to James. That they're trying to undermine the Stuart throne and this infant king must be protected. Now, Mary herself signs a series of abdication articles that focus on her gender. And um, I'll show you an example in a moment, but they defy um, internal logic when you look at what she actually says. And the coronation oath that the, no, the, the, the Protestant faction makes uh, swears on James's behalf also brings in the fact that he is a, a new male Protestant monarch and he's replacing his mother and he will work to serve the kingdom and the new religion. Um, this portrait here, incidentally, is one that's done around 1583 and it itself is a propaganda piece. It's done to commemorate the, we think anyway, the political association between Mary and the 17-year-old the James and the idea that she would come back to Scotland um, and, and take up joint rule with him. But they never ever met like this in real life. I like this portrait because her face looks very suspicious of him. You know, she's kind of looking out the eye at him and saying, I don't know if I entirely trust you. And I think that's probably quite right. Now, what's interesting about this text here is this is the Act of Parliament that confirms Mary's abdication, and it's based on the letters of abdication that she signs. And in our portrait uh, done by Gavin Hamilton in the exhibition, you can almost imagine the document on that table being this one. I don't think it's written by Mary, but what it begins by, it focuses on her frailty as a woman. It begins by saying, not only is our body, spirit and senses so vexed, broken, disquieted, 
that no longer are we of ability in any manner to endure such great and intolerable pains and travails. And the only poem that's produced alongside this, it's in Latin, to commemorate the coronation and the events at Carberry Hill, uses this exact same line. It says that Mary is a woman, she's very exhausted, she, she can't handle the burden of rule, and she's handing it on to her infant son, which is a good thing to do. Um, but as, as, as Mary goes on into this text, she then says that um, she's worried that if she dies, her son won't have secure succession. Um, and in case she's taken from this life during the time of his minority, it's doubtful that he would succeed, success, he would accede to the throne successfully. But then she goes on to say, the best thing I can do is I won't raise him myself, but what I'll do is I'll hand him over to a group of my Protestant enemies, uh, Mort, the Earl of Morton and his kinsmen, to raise James. So the logic of the abdication document is complete nonsense. Why would Mary give up her son if she's worried about him being secure and succeeding? Why would she just renounce all rights to the throne and hand him over to the people that she's most scared of in Scotland? It's clearly a document that's made up by them using the relationship between mother and son for political purposes and saying that her gender limits her ability to rule. Other propaganda is used to portray Mary as evil, um, as a, a murderess and adulteress, and uses James as an innocent figure to do that. This is a sketch in the National Archive that was sent to the English government by diplomatic agents, and it shows the death of Darnley at Kirka Field in the top right corner. He's lying there um, with his head down towards the bottom of the screen, and the body of his half-naked servant is just above him. You can see the destruction of Kirka Field in the middle of the page, but in the top right corner, you can see there in the little cot bed, the infant James praying and saying, judge and revenge my cause, O Lord. And this is James using the text of a Protestant psalm to cry out for vengeance against his murdered father, whose body you can see being carried away and then buried in the bottom of the, the picture there. Now that image of James was used in banners and proclamations uh, around Carberry and in Edinburgh itself when Mary was being marched through the town. You can see another example of it here where James is saying, judge and revenge my cause, O Lord, over Darnley's body. And again, they've got the monogram of Jesus at the top of the, 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 the sigil there. We get a much nicer and fancier and valiant version of this picture by uh, Levin de Vogelaar, which is part of the royal collection. You can see it in Holyrood. And it's commissioned by Darnley's parents, uh, Matthew Stewart uh, and Margaret, the Earl and Countess of Lennox. In the middle of the portrait, we see a, a quite impressively postured 13 month old James. I'm quite impressed by how well he can stand on his own there. Um, and pray too, who knew a 13 month old could do that, eh? Um, but he's sitting there with a, a Latin scroll coming out of his mouth, speaking about vengeance and saying, please, God, give me the vengeance um, for those who killed my father. You can see his father lying behind him there, uh, prostrate. And then you've got his grandparents and his uncle Charles um, in, behind him in close succession. The Latin text around that image says Darnley is a great guy and that his mother is terrible and that he really shouldn't have been killed. And the tableau in the bottom corner where you can see the green field is a picture of Mary being removed at Carberry Hill. It's a propaganda piece commissioned by the Lennoxes that, say, that says in no doubt Mary is responsible for the murder of, of Darnley. And James himself, when he grows up, there's two versions of this portrait, but in, in the version that James had access to, he has all the propaganda on Mary scored out of it um, because he doesn't like what it says. So he's used, again, as a piece of propaganda. The, the King's Party were able to also use James's image and the concept of James as ruler right across coins, seals, custom letters, um, at every level of the court in Scotland, both at the national level and in things like the Edinburgh Commissary Court. And the first thing they did in August 1567 was to authorise a new coin piece to replace all the silver reals of Mary's reign. And this is one we show in the exhibition. It's, this is a, an example from 1570, but it's produced from 1567. And it's called the sword dollar because it shows a sword going through the imperial crown. It has James's title on the reverse. And it says as its motto, for me or against me, if I deserve it. 
And it's a note that says that Mary was rightfully deposed because of the crimes that she committed. And James has been appointed to uphold the, the kingdom and to uphold the Protestant faith. But it's saying that any monarch could be removed if, if they didn't uh, stand up to this. But we see a similar recasting of all levels of governmental seals with images relating to James. Um, and again, one of James's early coins, again, shows the young king. This is from 1580, but there were plans for coins like this for much earlier. And it says on this, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. And we, we show this one in the, in the exhibition too. But using the image of the young James to wipe out all memory of, of James's mother. We see it on publications as well. Mary had published Acts of Parliament in 1566, and then very quickly after that, the exact same frontispiece that's used in Mary's uh, Acts of Parliament has James's title replaced on it. Um, so again, using him very quickly to replace all memory of Mary. And another example of how they used Mary's gender to, um, to condemn her is seen in this proclamation. Now, Anne, Anne and I went, Angelo Beveridge, my partner in crime in this project, we spent a lovely day at Rothsey, um, at, at, at Butte House, going through their collections. And they've got a wonderful little collection of Marian items, including the, the full account of the execution by Robert Wingfield, the really famous one that talks about Mary's gr gruesome death. But they also have an actual copy of a proclamation set forth by Murray in 1568. And it's, it was really nice to see this in person, but it's interesting because there are many proclamations in, issued by the government, but this one is in James's voice. And it uses James, the infant James, who would have been one at this point. And again, he, he can speak quite well, as you can see, uh, when he says, what womanly mercy was in the person of her, Mary, that a last thought the shedding of Scott's blood a pleasant spectacle. What favour and clemency can men look for at her hands that stirs the sedition against us, her lawful son? Or what security can noble men or godly men think themselves into, she bearing the rule, the regiment, by whose occasion our most dear father, being a portion of her own flesh, was so used? God has his counsels to put in execution and already has begun to execute his judgments. So again, the idea here that Mary is unfeminine issued from James's mouth, that she's a terrible wife and a terrible um, mother, and using that idea to, to consolidate James's rule. Now, just finally, um, I'll briefly sketch out how James and Mary's later relationship panned out. One of the, the biggest things I found in the book, and one of the things that struck me most, was that in the negotiations to restore Mary back to Scotland between 1568 and 1570, um, there were sustained ag agreements about how Mary could be restituted between her, Cecil and Elizabeth. And Mary was the only one who was seriously willing to consider attempting to trade James to England and to Elizabeth um, for her own release. Right to the end of these negotiations, her team were still saying this was on the table, even though the Scottish nobility on both sides and the King's and Queen's party said no to this. And even though Elizabeth and Cecil thought they'll never give James up. Um, and so she was willing to do this on the advice of William Maitland of Lethington to continue. The two had little contact for most of the 1570s. There was one diplomatic visit by um, Mary's secretary now, but he wasn't allowed to see James because he refused to call James King. He only called him Prince. And James was actually deeply upset by this. He wanted any news he could get from his mother, but they were actively blocked from contact during James's minority. When James came of age, there were immediate plans put into place for an association. Um, the idea that Mary would come back to the throne in joint rule with James and would possibly be freed from English captivity. In exchange, James would be recognized by Mary as a legitimate ruler of Scotland in Catholic eyes. It was led between 1581 and 1585 by three of James's favorites, Esme Stewart, James Stewart, and Patrick Gray. Um, but ultimately, um, James and Mary were both really playing against each other for time. James had no intention of honoring the association negotiation. And Beth will talk about this a bit more, but I'm gonna show you one document from it. When 
James signs the Treaty of Berwick, an Anglo-Scottish peace and mutual defence treaty in July 1586. He completely loses any interest in his mother, and already his interest in her had been waning from the beginning of 1585, when this, this treaty was really beginning to develop. And James is faced with a really staunch decision in 1586, um, when Mary is found guilty of treason in the Babington plot. Does he protest with military strength? Does he really go after Elizabeth and complain bitterly about this, knowing that he too could be attainted as a, tra as a traitor and lose his place in the English succession? Or does he stay quiet about it and allow his mother to be tried and executed? Well, initially he doesn't take the, the associate, he doesn't take the, the accusations against Mary and the, the sentence seriously. He thinks that Mary will just be put into in prison. And when he realises that they are talking about executing her, he sends a small delegation led by William Keith and Archibald Douglas down to England in the winter of 1586. At the same time, though, he's in correspondence with the Earl of Leicester, and letters that he sends to Leicester are used by Archibald Douglas to suggest that James would be willing to digest the, the, the execution of Mary, should that go ahead. Um, James protests, and says that's absolutely not true, but we don't know if he is playing a double game here. If he's trying to say publicly, I don't want my mother to die, while covertly saying something else. Um, this is a, a, a portrait from the association. Uh, it's, it's, a, a, a do, it's a piece in the exhibition where we see James and Mary um, presented in John Leslie's History of Scotland. At this stage, though, the portrait shows Mary as an adult and James very much as a child, and all the text around it is emphasising that and saying that Mary is the rightful ruler and that James would do well to listen to his mother. As we get into the association, we see more equal portraits like this one. Um, and this one here, James is supposed to be 12 at the time and he looks about six. And I think that's done deliberately on purpose. It's done to minimise James's authority in this publication in Rome. Now, James sends many letters to Mary promising um, love, fealty, honour and admiration. Um, this is my favourite one. This is a notarial copy in the National Archives. And in it, James promises love and honour to his mother and to serve him. But he also gets the, the scribe to put this little heart mark here, just that you can see um, it's a little heart um, at the top of the page, which is copied from the original letter that is sent to Mary. It's really duplicitous. He doesn't mean it at all, I don't think, but it's very nice to see. And he also uses letters to try and save Mary's life. James, as we know, is a brilliant writer, um, but he can use rhetoric quite well. And he sends a letter in November 1586 to um, William Keith, but he notes in it that what Elizabeth is doing is terrible. And he says, King Henry VIII's reputation was never prejudged in anything but in the beheading of his bedfellows, making a direct reference to Elizabeth's mother, Anne Boleyn. That made Elizabeth so angry that she almost shut off all negotiations for Mary's restitution, or Mary's um, clemency. And then James was reduced in January 1587 to appealing to Elizabeth and saying, what madam can greatly greatly a touch my honour that is a king and a son than that my nearest neighbour and my straightest friend would rigorously put to death a free and sovereign prince and my natural mother alike in state and sex to her that so uses her um, and touching her so nearly in proximity of blood. So he does try to use letters to save her but ultimately we know that this is in vain. Right, so that was a whirlwind tour of their relationship, but as you can see, the fact that James is male and Mary is female immediately puts them at loggerheads in Scottish politics, and it effectively writes the end of Mary's reign, um, arguably something very different would have happened if she hadn't had a child. Um, a wide range of propaganda is used to create a divide between the two of them, to assert James as an actual ruler, um, and religion is a key part of that as well. But ultimately, James and Mary didn't really have a relationship, certainly not as mother and son. They were political rivals, deeply pragmatic, pragmatic and viewed one another as commodities. But that family connection died the moment that Mary left um, James's side in April 1567. Thanks very much. <laughs>